Um, so now to introduce our first speaker, we'll be Skyping in, so fingers crossed that will all go well. Uh, this is Monica Bakker, and Monica Bakker is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Adam Mikiewicz University in Poznan in Poland. She writes on contemporary art and aesthetics with a particular focus on post-humanist gender and cross-cultural perspectives. The author of two books, Biotransfigurations, Art and Aesthetics of Post-Humanism, 2010 in Polish, and Open Body, 2000, also in Polish. She's the co-author of Pieroma, Pleroma, Art in Search of Fullness, 1989, and editor of Australian Aboriginal Aesthetics, 2004, also in Polish, Going Aerial, Air, Art and Architecture, 2006, and The Life of Air, Dwelling, Communicating, Mapping, 2011. And since 2001, she has been an editor of the Polish cultural journal Czakcz, Kultury, hope I pronounced that correctly, Time of Culture. So, Monica, here you go. Oh, hello. Hello. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, and thanks to all those who made this event possible. So, I'm going to jump right into my paper, and uh, the title of it is uh, Deep Time Environments, Art and the Materiality of Life beyond the human. And I need the first slide, please, because I don't see the slides, so I hope they're there. Time is uh, an inhuman force, which, as Elizabeth Grosh puts it, has the capacity to hide in objects. These objects may be living and non-living, contemporary and long gone, small as a grain of sand or big as a planet. A planetary perspective on human life vis-a-vis -vis non-human forms brings to attention not only vast spatial dimensions, but also immense temporal dimensions. Human experience, then, is not limited to the living on Earth, but actually being Earth, or perhaps, as Rosie Braidotti puts it, becoming Earth, and the temporal dimension of the materiality um, of life opens up a perspective of the co-evolution, uh, opens up a um, perspective of the coevolution of life and environment that is organic and inorganic matter in complexities and scales way beyond the human and perhaps even beyond life as we know it. In this talk, I would like to analyze artworks investigating temporal dimensions of life beyond human. I chose artworks which stand on the crossroads of um, art and science Bearing in mind the Deleuze's statement that philosophy, art, and science, I quote, come into relations of mutual resonance and exchange, end of quote. Artists Cathy Patterson, Oliver Kelhammer, and Adam Brown, whose work I'm going to present, collaborate with scientists who deal with materiality of life on several different levels and evoke scales which do not comply with human scale, neither on the individual level nor the level of the species. The artwork themselves are specifically situated here and now, and the resonance with the techno-scientific status quo is clear. But as Deleuze points out, it is not monitoring, but impinging and relevance of philosophy, science, and art which counts. I would like to demonstrate then how the specific artworks with their own specific methods of research resonate with the post-humanist attitudes in the inquiry into deep time perspective on life. And I need the second slide, please. Viewing all bodily lives, including ours, as metabolic processes unfolding in time, as flows of matter and energy, call for recognition of what Katrin Yusuf named the geologic life, postulating to see, I quote, our ways of being as geological rather than biological per se, end of quote. In this context, I would like to discuss Cathy Patterson, Patterson's artwork, Fossil Necklace, which focuses on materiality of geologic life. The necklace consists of 170 beads made out of carved fossils. The work, however, does not look like a luxury item, but rather resembles an object of contemplation. For non-experts, um, non-expert viewers actually, who certainly wouldn't be able to recognize the fossils and distinguish between the oldest and the youngest specimens, and the time gap may be um, as big as two billion years, the artist provides a descriptive map and a magnifying glass. A second, uh, a third um, slide, please. 
the careful study is recommended and the viewers can find themselves uh, can find names of the fossils as well as the indication of the location where they were found the oldest bead of the necklace is a fossilized archaean stromatolite found in the contemporary south africa stromatolites consist of layers of cyanobacteria the most ancient life form producing oxygen which trap minerals from water and build so-called living rocks and among the youngest fossils of the necklace are bones of a horse from the time of the beginning of agriculture and hippos bones from the Mesopotamian period. And yet, human fossils per se are not part of the necklace. But there are numerous beads made of fossilized organisms contemporary to our close ancestors. Apart from those already mentioned beads relating to the modern homo, there is Kenyan meos and amber being a fossilized resin, which relates in time and space to the human chimpanzee divergence um, in East Africa about six, seven million years ago. Coral bead of the Pleistocene, to give another example, relate to the, pros uh, to the presence of Homo erectus in e East Asia. And the fossilized mammoth rib relate to the presence of Neanderthals in Europe. This shows that deep time environments were populated not only, uh, obviously at one point, not only by one, but multiple human ancestors, whose traces may be found in DNA of modern humans. Katrin Yusuf points out that, especially with the fossil records of Denisovan, disputed Homo floresiensis, and the sequencing of Neanderthal's DNA, whose genetic material up to 4% got incorporated into modern Euro-Asian genome, the origin of Homo sapiens is not one. I quote, the genus of the human is rapidly becoming articulated as multiplied, situated, um, and genetically differentiated, end of quote. And next slide, please. Yet, dealing with fossilized life, we come to immensity of forms and connections, which can only be hinted, as Henry Gee in his book In Search of Deep Time suggests, I quote, fossils, such as fossils of creatures we hail as our ancestors, continue primary evidence for the history of life, but each fossil is an infinitesimal dot lost in fathomless sea of time whose relationship with other fossils and organisms living in the present day is obscure, end of quote. And because fossils come to existence accidentally and in specific environmental circumstances, we will never have a complete picture of the life long gone. Moreover, fossils, also those included in Patterson's necklace, are not only parts of organisms' actual bodies, because so-called trace fossils are evidences that an organism passed that way. In other words, what we deal with is an element of fossilized environment of the organism. The necklace, then, is a string of things, as Elizabeth Grosh would call them, when she writes, I quote, the thing emerges out of and as substance. It is the coming into existence of prior substance or thing in a new time. The thing, she continues, is a certain carving out of the real, the artificial or arbitrary division of real into entities, bounded and contained system, nominal or usable units that exist within the real only as open systems, end of quote. There is then only, not only immensity of time, but also immensity of forms and entanglements of organic and inorganic matter in a constant flow. And the fifth slide, please. Mm -hmm. Unlike in Patterson's work, where materiality of life of deep time is fossilized, in Oliver Kalhammer's project, Neo Eocene, we come to contact with life forms which lived through geologic time but are still alive now, and which Charles Darwin called living fossils. Kalhammer's goal is to recreate forests of the Eocene and in this way, connect deep past with the future by planting trees such as metasequoia, sequoia and ginkgo, among others, in the way, sorry, in the area which is now Canada and which 
they populated in the past as known from fossil records. Eocene is the point of reference here, as it was a geological epoch which started with a dramatic warming of the climate about 55.8 million years ago, when even the polar regions were inhabited by warm weather species of animals and plants. And next slide, please. Kalhammer's project Neo-Eocene refers to the changing global conditions, especially global warming. He started it in 1990s in a modest scale in his Cortes Islands yard, and then in 2008, with help of a botanist, Rupert Sheldrake, he extended his experiment to a bigger area on the other side of the same island. With the extended project, an interesting dispute developed with the forestry department concerning a question, what is a native species? A question which is usually related rather to space than time. The artist's opinion, however, brings a new perspective on the issue as he explains that, I quote, native should be expanded to incorporate formerly, even prehistorically, native species, given the distribution of present-day biogeoclimatic zones, and surely like to change, is, is surely like to change. Kelhammer, with his project Neo-Eocene, creates a possibility as he says, I quote, to experience the world beyond our own species, comparatively recent dominance of the planet. Explaining that, he continues, looking into the past was one thing. There were rocks and fossils to serve as clues for what had happened. But what about the future, he asked. With the global warming, the future may belong to those species which have already proved to be able to deal with similar conditions. Moreover, as recent studies suggest, plants are more resilient to events leading to extinction than animals. The metasequoia, or dawn, or dawn redwood, as it is called, being one of Kelhammer's botanical choices, is among the greatest botanical finds of the 20th century. It had been believed to be extinct until 1940s, and until then had been known only from the fossils. It turned out, however, that a small population of these trees survived in the forests of central China. Similarly, a small population of ginkgo trees survived in another part of China and has been revived by Buddhist monks who cultivated them in their gardens. In anticipation of significant global warming, the artist wants to bring back these trees to the northern environments on the premise that as these species were prevalent during the Eocene, thermal maximum, they might be suited for the hot climate to come. Not only that they pr prove to be very adaptable, but also they may be those who could take over territories vacated by species which will go extinct. And uh, I hope we have the slide number seven on or up. This is what I need. Yet the future climate and its impact on Kelhammer's young forest of a deep time, partially consisting of living fossils, is impossible to predict. The Neo-Eocene is unknown, but as the name Eocene, coined in 1833 by Charles Lyell and derived from the Greek words Eos, meaning dawn, and Kainos, meaning recent, the Neo-Eocene similarly is not viewed in catastrophic terms, but possibly as a new dawn as well. As the biologist Daniel Silvestro suggests, I quote, in the plant kingdom, mass extinction events can be seen as opportunities for turnover leading to renown, renowned biodiversity, end of quote. And now uh, slide number seven, please. Another anticipated version of the dawn, of a new dawn, actually, which is well grounded in deep time, is offered by artist Adam Brown in his work Rebiogenesis, Origins of Life. This project, as he says, consists of, um, I quote, extreme minimal ecosystems capable of the autopoetic evolution of 
prebiotic chemistries capable of attaining life. And of course, like Kelhammer's forest, Brown's project is performative. It is not representing the new beginning or new beginnings, but actually the artist makes an attempt for a reenactment of it. As a curator uh, in Ke Arms states, I quote, artistic reenactments do not simply affirm what has happened in the past, but question the present by taking recourse to historical events that have left their traces in collective memory. End of quote. In case of Brown's reenactment of Origins of Life, collective memory may at best be located in organic and non-organic things, materialities of the living and the non-living, non-human rather than human. This could be memory of water, rocks, and plants, as discussed mm -hmm. by Bronisław Szerszyński. The enactment of an event of the non-human past only partially belongs to the natural history because it is based on human understanding of such processes and utilizing lab equipment. However, once the process is set up, it continues by the means of its own inhuman forces. And yet, even if life emerges in rebiogenesis experiment, it may neither be noticed, nor surviving for long. So I hope you are watching the video as a background to what I'm talking about, because I really want to underline the fact that um, rebiogenesis is, uh, has this um, um, element of reenactment. It's not an object, but a process. But what does it really mean, then, to posit the question of origins of life? Elizabeth Grosch, critically speaking about origin in Darwinian context, points out that the origin, I quote, is in a certain sense impossible to understand as a locatable or knowable entity, a definite point in time, a single chemical reaction, for it is an origin that is not one, that is always already implicated in multiplicity of difference, in a constellation of transformations, an event that imperceptibly affects everything." End of quote. Contemporary research suggests that life may have originated in more than one location, hence the chemical and physical contingencies may have been different, leading to the emergence of life dwelling, sorry, emergence of other life dwelling in conditions unsuitable for carbon-based life, and therefore not in competition with it, or possibly not familiar life, is in a symbiotic relation with others, but has yet not been recognized as such. Again, there is really no reason to believe that we, the carbon life forms, are alone. And this concerns not only outer space, but also, and perhaps more importantly, our local habitat, the planet. With the abundance of existing matter, we cannot exclude other options. As Jane Bennett points out, I quote, if we think we already know what is out there, we will almost surely miss much of it, end of quote. We cannot exclude the possibility that life emerged more than once on Earth and in forms other than that represented by ourselves. However, life based on a different principle may be very difficult to recognize, so it may already be around us and we simply do not know what to look for. In concluding, I would like to underline that art inquiries into planetary environments investigating, investigated in terms of deep time actually offer reconsideration of our own position as a species and as carbon life forms and open up yet another way to look into the future of the planet. Fossils, living fossils, minerals, and organic matter show what Delande explains, writing that, I quote, over the millennia, it is the flow of biomass through food webs, as well as flow of genes through generations that matters, not the bodies and species that emerge from these flows, end of quote. However, in our own scale, 
the scale of individuals and species entangled in food webs, autotrophic and heterotrophic metabolic systems, rearticulating materiality in ways not yet fully comprehended and not, and not fully predictable, we need to reconsider our views on subjectivity and our ways of belonging to inhuman forces and tentative materialities. Because, as Grosch points out, I quote, it is matter, the thing that produces life, sustains and provides life with its biological organization and orientation, and it requires life to overcome itself, to evolve, to become more. End of quote. Thank you.